Good morning. Welcome. It's good to see you all here this morning. Lovely, lovely morning. Uh, it was so nice to sleep under the blankets last night, wasn't it? Oh, that was just phenomenal. So hope you're enjoying the cooler weather. We uh, Lots of flowers this morning, remembering Percy. And so we had a lovely time honoring him yesterday. And uh, honorable man, life well lived and much to be thankful for and also a great loss. And so we will continue to uh, support and offer comfort to Sandy and the rest of the family. And uh, we're thankful for Percy, and it was great to celebrate his life, and we have the flowers to remember him again this morning. Now the mundane things, announcements, got to have them. Um, (laughs) Sunday school is coming. And we're going for it. So September 13th, we're starting Sunday school, and uh, we will have uh, dinner afterwards, potluck dinner. I believe there's sign-up sheets back there, and so you can sign up for that to make sure we get the right proportion of all the good stuff and not too much of the bad stuff, and we try to keep that all you know, in, right, in right order. So that'll be great. Uh, so avail yourself of that. Um, Lewis Lake 101, if you're interested in becoming a part of Lewis Lake, interested in membership, I encourage you to take advantage of Lewis Lake 101. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, several have signed up already, and, uh, and when we get a few more, Pastor Bob will work on getting dates and times for that. But that will be this fall, Lewis Lake 101. It's a, it's a three-session class, tell you sort of who we are and what we're all about. And uh, it's informative and fun. And... Um, if you time it right, Sandy will probably make food for it, so, because <laughs> so, that's kind of the way that goes. So anyway, um, September 26th, uh, we're having a concert for our youth, and we're not advertising that, but we're doing it, and so um, particularly for the youth, but if you'd like to be involved in that, if you'd like to come and hear spoken play, that's going to be September 26th. We will eat before that because that's exactly what we do, Uh, so that'll be wonderful. So take note of that, especially uh, young folks, and uh, invite your friends and come, and that'll be an enjoyable evening. Our regular Bible studies are taking place Tonight, 6.30, working on the book of Obadiah and Pastor Bob on Friday mornings at 10.30 is working through the book of Ephesians. So if you'd like to make your, uh, avail yourself of those opportunities as well. A couple of little uh, updates. Um, Joyce's brother, Jerry Carpenter, has been moved from his home to a hospice facility in Madison. And so uh, be in prayer for Joyce and and the family there, those are uh, tough moves. They're, they're good moves, they're helpful, but they're also tough because those are kind of one-way streets and we understand that, right? And along those lines, continue to pray for Gordy, um, who has been in a lot of pain and is now on morphine and uh, last I heard is not eating uh, particularly well. So, um, so, But he's still with us and so if you get a chance to touch base with Gordy, uh, please do so. All right. Let me invite you to stand, and uh, I'm going to ask the band to come up, and we are going to say our call to worship. We'll do this together. I, this, is a, this is a great verse, and I hope you can say this from your heart, so let's do this together, shall we? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. So we turn our attention now to the reading of the Word of God, the public reading of Scripture. And this morning we'll be reading from Titus chapter 2. Here is the Word of God. For the grace of God has appeared. Isn't that cool? Grace appearing, like, Jesus' grace personified appears bringing salvation. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You, You see what Jesus has done here? He appears brings salvation, and teaches us to live in a godly way. Those are intimately connected. You can't divorce them. 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are, this is the kind of people he's purifying, people who are zealous for good works. And may that be true of us this morning. And we are going to engage in a good work, and that is to pray for our brothers and sisters. And Pastor Bob is going to come and talk to us a little bit about our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. Before I mention uh, Nigeria, I would just uh, comment that uh, it was a fun morning. This morning we sang All Creatures of Our God and King, and uh, the praise that's lifted up. And uh, right now, as you probably have observed, the deer are hitting the acorns pretty hard. And so we had about nine deer in the yard this morning. And uh, one particular fawn took exception to the neighbor's cat coming through our lawn and and so he was chasing the cat around, which was kind of fun to watch. So anyway, I, I just think God is glorified in those little moments when, when nature is doing what nature does and bring glory and honor to God. Contrary to the natural glory that nature lifts up to the Lord, human beings are another matter. And I ran across this uh, story this past week, and I thought I would make it a matter of prayer for us as we uh, worship today. Uh, Nigeria, uh, this is a in headline from the uh, Breakpoint uh, website, and uh, this is what it says. According to the United States Institute of Peace, Nigeria is Africa's most populous country, largest economy, and biggest democracy. It is a bellwether for the continent. In fact, by 2050, Nigeria will likely have the fourth largest population in the world behind India and China and the United States. According to former Representative Frank Wolf, as goes Nigeria, so goes Western Africa. The persecution of religious minorities anywhere is a terrible thing. But Nigeria's growing status in the world makes the ongoing persecution of Christians here even more troubling. For years now, Boko Haram and the Muslim Fulani militants have killed, raped, kidnapped, and sought to cleanse parts of northern Nigeria of its Christian population. All the while, the government of Nigeria has embraced a policy of indifference, if not complicity even, in what is rightly called a genocide by observers both inside and outside the country. Still tragically, what the world continues to hear about Nigeria hasn't been enough for alarm to become action. How many of you have heard about the atrocities in Nigeria this week? A few of you have, not too many. It doesn't make the news. Why not? It's the biggest thing going right now, the persecution in Nigeria. But news agencies pick and choose what they report, and this is not something they want to report. Uh, that makes Nigeria's silent slaughter campaign a project that the International Committee on Nigeria feels is so very important. And so they, they've begun a movement to try to raise awareness of the genocide and of the uh, militant actions against the Christian population in Nigeria. And I would just like to lift that up before us today to let you know that it's happening and to encourage you when you remember the persecuted church to especially pray for uh, these b b uh, brothers and sisters in Nigeria. So let's take a moment, shall we, and let's lift up prayer for Nigeria. Father in heaven, we can't imagine 
what it might be like, although we're starting to be able to imagine a little more, what it might be like to be a persecuted group. But especially for the Nigerian brothers and sisters, we pray today as they experience and have experienced for a long time the efforts to cleanse them off the face of the earth and to get rid of them, to abuse them, and to turn them away from you. Father, we pray that you would grant unto the church in Nigeria strength and courage and boldness as they seek to stand firm in their faith against these very difficult efforts to move them. We pray that your Holy Spirit would grant a deliverance. We pray for the success of this campaign, that you would uh, raise awareness around the world and that people would see what is happening and recognize the crime in it and come and bring assistance and aid to our brothers and sisters there. So, Lord, grant your grace. We pray for the victory of the gospel as it goes forth in every place where there is opposition, where there is resistance. And we pray that your spirit would continue to miraculously lay your hand upon hearts and minds to draw people into your kingdom, unto yourself, as you br bring forward your plan of salvation for the world. So we lift these brothers and sisters up to you today, and we pray for them, O Lord, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Another opportunity, uh, if you'd like to avail yourself to engage in good works and help your community, is through a blood drive that we're going to be uh, hosting here at Lewis Lake on October 5th. Got about a 70-second video here just to give you a little intro to that. So go ahead and... Giving blood. I was excited to do it. I like to help people. It's just a small way that I can try to give back. It feels like you're doing a good thing for society. It means a lot to me that my donation is going to go out to help somebody. It's a very worthwhile opportunity to give back to the community. It's easy. You can help strangers. That's the best feeling in the world, helping strangers. I tend to think, you know, what if it was a family member or someone I knew who needed blood? I would want it to be there for them. Everybody needs to have the chance for life, and this is one of those opportunities to do that for people. As a physician, firsthand I get to see the importance of blood and people that are in need of blood transfusions. It's such a simple thing that without a lot of effort that you can do to actually save someone's life. Come on out and help. Donate blood with the Red Cross. All right, so again, that will be October 5th. That will be uh, happening here. Um, if you'd like to be involved in that, there's a number of ways. Um, one is to be involved in the event, and, uh, and there's a number of different projects and things that uh, need to happen for this to come together. So talk to Tammy about that. None of the volunteer positions include using needles, okay? So just relax. It's okay. We're not going to stick a needle in your hand, uh, except maybe Bethany and uh, some of our nurses. We can, but anyway, so... Uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, please do that. If you'd like to sign up to give blood, uh, a number of you already have, but you could talk to Tammy and she can help you with that as well, or you can do that online, all right? And uh, so see Tammy for any more information about that. I don't know if it's uh, changed or not, but if you're uh, checking your phone right now to uh, do something more interesting than the sermon, the internet was out earlier today, so I don't know if it's working or not, so... Uh, we're going to take our Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes. I'm excited about the blood drive. One of our elders decided, you know, it came, brought that suggestion forward saying, hey, maybe this is something we need to do as a church. And so it is an all-church project. And uh, the council said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go for it. And so we're, we're needing volunteers to sign up to help with the committees to do the various uh, roles and things that need to happen. And uh, so please uh, take a look at how you can help and how you can be part of that. We're turning to Ecclesiastes. Where is Ecclesiastes? I can't, but my Bible doesn't have it today. Here it is. I finally found it. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. 
Have you ever uh, seen a man planting corn in the middle of January around here? <laughs> How about uh, a lady mowing a lawn that is covered with a foot of snow? Have you, uh, have you ever seen somebody wearing a parka and mittens out on the beach on a 90 degree day? Those are all things that would happen out of time, out of their season. I get the, uh, the great uh, opportunities for the, the cheap room rates, you know, if you want to go to the, the beach in July or something like that. They didn't have the annual meeting this year for the covenant, but that was in Phoenix in June. And you're not going for the weather on that day. Well, to be in the right season and doing the right thing when it is the right season is uh, something we all strive to do. And we talked about that with Percy yesterday. One of the things we mentioned is that Percy had a very keen sense of what season it was, and what, when it was time to do what. Today, the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes is going to uh, talk to us about seasons and times and human activities, the activities of man. And we're going to begin in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1 to look at a poem that uh, lands and finds its, itself in Ecclesiastes today. So let's read it here, chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. The writer has been uh, telling us about secular life, about life that doesn't have God in it, about life that is no spiritual dimension acknowledged, just natural human secular life in this world, and he has observed very closely uh, both in the first chapter and the second chapter, that when it comes to just plain old secular life, all is vanity, all seems to be useless, and nothing is, is lasting, and nothing has full meaning, and we get bored with everything, and this is secular life. And the only way that you can uh, make secular life somewhat fulfilling is to infuse it with large amounts of cash <laughs> and uh, with activities. Now, in Ecclesiastes, the writer in chapter 3 takes a little bit of a different turn, and he includes or writes himself uh, this poem that we just read. And this poem is actually very, uh, this is very sophisticated Hebrew writing. So I would like to take just a moment to try to increase your appreciation of this poem and to help you just to see a couple things about it. Uh, this is actually, as I said, a very sophisticated he Hebrew poem embedded in the early going of the Ecclesiastes, and the structure is what the scholars call chiastic. Chiastic, C-H-I-A-S-T-I-C, chiastic. A chiasm is from the Greek language, which means an X. An X, key, is how you say that in the uh, Greek. And you'll see this in Christian symbolism frequently, uh, that, that this chiastic thing is marked with an X. Uh, this is also the first letter of the name Christ. 
So anyway, so it's, uh, it's in the shape of an X. And let me show you that. Go back to that previous slide. So here is an example taking the first verse, or the uh, second, well, the first verse. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Now notice the structure. You have, there's everything up there and every matter down here. There's a season and there's a time. And they're very balanced and very organized. Uh, in verse 8, we see it also, I don't know if I put that on a slide, but verse 8 has it as well, a time to love, you see the word love and peace go together, and also the, uh, and maybe I do have that on a slide, do, do I have one up there? I don't remember if I put that on the PowerPoint or not, but I do have it in my notes. So there's a time to love, and there's a time for peace, for instance, and then there's a time for, for war and a time to hate. So those kind of connect with each other on every other phrase. And so it's all very balanced. Uh, verses 1 through 8 have this chiastic structure that creates kind of bookends. Verses 1 through 8, are 1 and 8 rather, are a little bit different. And then verses 2 through 7 match a series of positives and negatives, their corresponding negative in a very balanced way as well. And so you'll see, for instance, time to be born, time to die, that's the positive and the negative, time to plant and the time to pluck up, what is planted, positive and negative, and so forth. And then um, when you get to verse 8, notice that verse 8 has nouns rather than verbs. And so this kind of signals that this is the end of this little poem, okay? Verse 8 is, notice, uh, say for instance in verse 7, there's a time to tear and a time to sow. Tearing and sowing are verbs. There are, those are things you do. But in verse 8, love and peace are nouns. Those are things that just are what they are. They're not action. It's so war and, and hate. And so in this way, the writer signals that this is kind of the end of the poem now. This is the concluding verse. Uh, and so uh, just overall, uh, understand that this poem is very balanced, very symmetrical, and there is verbal balance in each line as well with the positives and the negatives. And so this is not just something that somebody sat down one day and just blew off the top of their head. But this is very uh, detailed work done by a very educated person to write in a very sophisticated way a poem filled with powerful meaning and truth. As we said, the poem lifts up various activities that one would be doing in life and then matches it with its polar opposite, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, time to heal, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. But what I want you to uh, recognize in here is that Hebrew poetry addresses the heart more than the mind, if I can say that. That isn't completely true, but in a sense it is. Hebrew poetry talks about how you feel rather than about logical truth, okay? So... Um, it's a good description of how life feels. We should maybe not take the language too literally, uh, even, even as we don't take things completely literally in the Psalms in, in every aspect. Some of these are very graphic, descriptive things. So, for example, a time to kill and a time to hate, uh, those are killing and hating are things that our Lord says we really shouldn't do in normal life. So, so again, sometimes you feel like that, but those aren't things that you actually should do. And so uh, in normal life, these things are out of bounds. But there are times like war and uh, times of great criminal deeds that happen in which maybe there is a time to put somebody to death or there is a time to exercise that righteous uh, hatred against something evil that has happened to something. But in, in normal life, these are things that this is how we feel. It isn't exactly how we act in every situation. 
So this is Hebrew poetry, and this is the poem as we have it. And as you look at that, and we say, well, all right, so it's a fancy poem. There's high-level meaning to it and structure and symmetry. But what does it say to us? I, I have two uh, aspects of this that I think uh, the, the poem has to say. First of all, there is a challenge in here. And then secondly, there's a frustration. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, what is the challenge that this poem presents to you and I today? The poem is set in the context of the book of Ecclesiastes, and it presents us with an important challenge. And here it is. Can we discern what season we are in? Can we discern what season we are in? What, are, what season are we in right now? And what should we be doing right now that we are in this particular season? Is this a time to mourn or a time to dance? Is this a, a time to break things down or is it a time to, to build things up? You know, that, that's the question. What, what kind of season? The, the poem lays all these different seasons before us. There's a season for everything, and there's a time to do this and a time to do that. What season are we in right now, and what should we be doing? That's the challenge for you and I to try to discern and understand. And furthermore, we can ask this question of what season are we in in various ways. So, for instance, um, what season are you in? As far as your personal life goes, you and your own functioning in this world, and your own, how, how are things going for you? What's happening to you personally in your life? I'm in a season of this. I'm in a season of that. With Percy's passing, we're in a season of mourning, certainly, but also celebrating. You know, what season are you in personally? Are, are you in a time where things are going really well? Are you in a time where things are not going so well? Are you in a season where you should be doing this kind of activity? Are you in a season where you should be giving yourself to this particular project? How do you organize the priorities of what you do in life based on what season are you in personally? Uh, you can also say, what season are you in as far as your chronological life goes? What season are you in as far as your chronological life goes? So, all right, so Bob is uh, 63 years old, and he's uh, kind of moving into a season. Uh, he recognizes that uh, to finish strong in this business of life is important, you know, and he recognizes that even though he wants to do great things and do a lot of things, he doesn't quite have the energy he used to <laughs> have <laughs> and so forth. You know, what, what, what season are you in chronologically? Are, are you approaching that strong finish or are you building a, a, uh, a life? Are you in the early stages? Are you in your 20s and you're building and you're, you're developing and you're creating this life that you're going to enter into? Are you a teenager? Are you, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, what, one of the challenges of understanding your chronological life, uh, you know, in America, sociologists tell us that, uh, you know, there never used to be this thing called adolescence, right? There never used to be such a thing as a teenager. You were a kid, and then you were an adult, and it happened just like that at about the age of 12 or 13. And now we have uh, adolescents, these teenage years, which are designed for uh, learning things, but also having a good time and playing and enjoying life. And now the sociologists tell us that the period of adolescence lasts until the age 30, you know. And so, <laughs> so all the 20-year-olds the in, in the world are acting like, like junior high kids and so forth, you know, and college kids are doing things that, 
that uh, maybe were appropriate for a different age. And so what age are you in? What, what is your season in life? Are you building and growing strong? Are you in the prime of your life where you're really bellying into the work that God has given you to do? Are you, are you growing that? Are there things that you could do? You know, there are things that I'm doing now I never did when I was in my 20s or 30s. You just didn't have time for it. You just didn't, you didn't have the opportunity in life. But now I'm in a different season of life. And so, yeah, some of my activities are changing a little bit, backing off on the intensity of things. And I'm finding I'm in a different season of life. And so you just have to ask that question and say, am I doing the things in my life that are appropriate for the season in which I'm in, just chronologically. Or you can, you can ask the question, what season are we in when it comes to God's time? When it comes to God's time, what is, what is God's time? What is, what is God doing in the world, and what is God's plan for the world, and where are we in that plan? And so... As we think about the uh, work of God, we think about, well, what season is it? This is a season of sowing and planting and growing and, and so forth. And, and is, is God <laughs> uh, leading us forward into some kind of a particular season of life? Are we entering a time of persecution as the church? Are we uh, entering a time where there is great opportunity for this or for that? What season are we in as far as God's time is concerned? And then kind of related to that, but maybe I'll, I'll break it out in just a little different terms. What season are we in when it comes to eternity? To eternity. All right, we are, in our Bible study on Friday, we talked about what age this is. We talked about the fact that when God created the world, it was the age of purity and innocence, and everything was wonderful, but we are now living in the age of sin, the age where sin has affected everything, and, and we live in this age in which sin is pervading and the effects of sin, the curse of sin, and so we're in that age, but we're looking forward to a new age when there will be restoration and healing, and transformation, and eternity, and, and all kinds of perfection. And so, uh, what, what season are we in when it comes to eternity? Um, you know, the, the, the world says, hey, you only live once in life, so go for all the gusto you can. But if you start thinking about what is our season right now, maybe you would instead look at it this way, now is the season of cultivating and growing, cultivating the Word of God and growing in Christ and reaching out uh, to invite others to come into the kingdom of God. And we, we need to be giving ourselves to those things. And the time to go for all the gusto in life is in the next age, not in this one. You know, th this, is, this is not the time for going for all the, the joy and happiness you can get. Now is the time to make sure we're cultivating the Word of God in our lives and growing close to Christ and walking with Him in faith and reaching out in service to the world around us. And, and in the age to come, the age that we will enter into, now is the time when you can go for the gusto. Now is the time where you can just grab every joyful pleasure you can ever Imagine, because that's what that age is for. What season are we in? Every once in a while, Sandy will say to me, Bob, now is not the time for that. <laughs> and usually, you know me, um, I tend to uh, find humor in almost anything. You know, and, and uh, I can carry on for a whole day one big joke, right? And everything is funny and making snide comments about things. My superintendent, Mark uh, Stromberg, when I was chairman of the uh, Ministerial Association, uh, they tried to control me a little bit and tried to encourage me not, 
had to get to uh, off with the microphone when I was leading meetings and so forth. And finally, I, heard, I overheard him say to somebody, he's not trying to be funny. This is just how he is. You know, it, it's the reality. And, and so, uh, but, but the big problem with that is sometimes you can try to make a funny comment about something in a moment when funny comments are not called for, when, when this is not the right thing to do. And that's when Sandy will look at me and go, Bob, now is not the time for that. It's the wrong season for that. It's a, it's a season for something different. It's a season to say something. And so I will many times have a thought jump into my head, and I will think I should say that, and that will be funny and cute. And then immediately, I'm, I'm getting better at this. Maybe I'm in a season in my life where I'm a little more reflective. And then I will say to myself, Bob, shut up. Do not even think about saying that because that is not, now is not the time for that to happen, all right? So, uh, you see, what, what we may be doing at any given moment can be fine in and of itself. No problem, nothing wrong with it. But it might be the wrong season for that thing. You might be doing that thing at the wrong time. Now is not the time for it. There are other, more important things to be doing right now. And so you and I are faced with a challenge from this poem as we look at all of these different seasons. We say, what season am I in in all of these ways, and what should I be giving myself to in this season that really needs to happen so that I will be um, set to go in the next season that comes along? All right, so that's the first thing. That's the challenge. What season am I in? The poem also presents with us a frustration. A frustration. One of the major frustrations of life is the desire for permanence. The desire for permanence, okay? Okay. Since, since time roll, what this poem is saying, there's a season for everything, and the seasons roll on. And we, here we go. And again, this is secular life. And so we, we, we're in this season, and then it turns into this season, and then it turns into this season. Uh, we are in the end of August, and the uh, summer is behind us for the most part. The acorns are falling. We're thinking about hunting deer and other things. And we know that uh, winter is coming and that there's nothing we can do about that. One season rolls to the next. And we, we're struggling with that because the, since time rolls on from one season to the next, the fact of the matter is nothing is permanent in our secular regular physical lives. Nothing is permanent. Whenever we run into something really good, the natural response of the human heart is to try to make that thing a permanent feature in our lives. Whenever we run into, we create, we, we find a situation that's wonderful we say, oh, this is awesome. And, and our effort is to say, I'm going to make that a permanent part of my life forever. That's our, that's our natural response to that situation. Uh, we, we go out and we uh, go on vacation and we see the mountains and the great mountain view and we say, this is so awesome. What if we could wake up to this every morning? And so... We go out and we buy a home in the mountains. We move to the mountains and we're going to live there permanently. See, that's that effort of trying to make the wonderful things in our life permanent. We want them always to be there. I love to play video games. And so I'm going to buy a portable video player so that I can take it with me and play video games wherever I go. I, I don't want to lose that. I want to make that a permanent part of my life. And you can name whatever other kind of thing you want to. The natural effort is to say, uh, you know, I like warm weather. 
I'm going to make that a permanent part of my life. I like uh, this. I like the seasons. I'm going to make that a permanent part of my life. It's this effort at permanentizing the good things in life. But the desire to make the good things of life permanent and always available to us is the natural consequence of being made in the image of God. That's actually kind of built into us. God put eternity into our hearts. We want things to be forever. We want things to be always. That's one of the hard things about heaven that we have. You get married and you have a wonderful marriage. I want this to last forever. And then the Bible comes along and says nobody's going to get married in heaven. I guess that's why you got to be married when you get there, right? What can they do about that? <laughs> nobody's going to get married in heaven, but if you're already married when you get there, maybe you get to be married. I don't know. But this is, this is the reality that God has put eternity in our hearts, and we long for permanent things to be there and to be good. But the preacher has discovered one thing about life. No season stays forever. No season stays forever. Now that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing, right? If it's a bad season, well, you don't want that to stay forever too. So when things are going badly, you'll say, well, it won't last forever. You know, we'll, we'll get out of this. We'll move on. But it can be a, a, a bad thing too if you say, well, this is a great time in my life. I want it to last forever. And you say, well, it's, it's not going to. David Dockery, writing in the Holman uh, Bible Commentary, makes this comment about this poem. He says, No permanent state of affairs exists in the world. This is a great source of frustration for people since longing for eternity is planted within us. You know, I, I remember uh, a few years ago, some, uh, more than a couple, but not more than 20, but I remember a, a period of time at church here at Lewis Lake where things were going absolutely perfectly. There was harmony in the body. There was powerful ministry going on. People were getting saved. The church was growing. We had lots of money. We had great, you know, council meeting was fun. It was just great things and positive things to look forward to. And it was just cooking along and cooking along. But I, I, I warned people around us. I say, enjoy it now while it's here. Enjoy the dickens out of it right now. Because this will not be, always be. Every season passes. Seasons will come and seasons will go. And this is how life is. Growing old is, as one person said, the process of loss. The process of loss. The older you grow, the more you lose. The more, you know, that thing that you used to do, you can't do so good anymore. The ability you, you used to have, those abilities deteriorate and go downhill. You, you, run it, you lose your health, you lose your <laughs> ability to, to uh, perform and, and so forth. I don't know if this is completely true, but I, I, I've often said this. It does old people absolutely no good to be rich because you can't do anything anyway. Sandy and I, we like to ride on the motorcycle. And now we're coming into retirement. Now, we, we have made a practice. We did not wait till retirement to go riding motorcycle. Because even now already, as young as we are, <laughs> riding the motorcycle is a little bit harder than it used to be, at least in the endurance end of things. And, and so I'm going to wait till I retire and then we're going to go motorcycle riding like crazy. And after the first trip, we say, holy smokes, I'm never doing that again. You know, <laughs> right? Old age is nothing but a series of losing one thing.
thing after another. And so this is the seasons. This is how it works. This is normal life. And it goes against that natural urge to make everything good, a permanent fixture in our lives. So what do we do with that? What do we do with such a poem as this? Well, we we could say, well, let's enjoy the good times while they're here, right? For we know another season is coming. So live it up while you can. That concept is, is in here, I think, to a certain extent. You can find that. But a thousand years later, another guy came up with a much better response. The Apostle Paul was speaking about the resurrection of the dead. And he says this, he says in uh, 1 Corinthians, he says, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So, So Paul says, he wasn't really thinking about Ecclesiastes, the book, but he was thinking about the concept. If... If, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if there is no eternal life, if there is nothing beyond this, then yeah, get the, every little bit of pleasure you can out of it because soon you'll be dead and you won't be able to do anything anymore anyway. That's, that's the philosophy of life. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. Secular life apart from God and his salvation is pretty meaningless and pretty useless. If all you have is secular life, the crash is coming. What's what's the peak moment in, in your life, in your lifespan? What's the moment where things are getting better and better and better, but now things start going down the hill? Where is that moment? where things start to change. Anybody know? I think they claim about the age 25. The age 25. So once you hit 25, that's the peak. That's the top. And you go down. Pro athletes are always talking about this, right? Yeah. Yeah, The old goat. Woo, 30 years old. Wow. You know, 40 years old, whatever he is, you know. You go downhill in a hurry. But when you come to Jesus Christ, suddenly life explodes with meaning and fulfillment and with purpose. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he calls them the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? The first fruits. Well, that means Jesus was just the first one. If you go out to your apple tree and it's all full of apples, and you take that first best one and you pick that off, well, that's Jesus. But you're, there's all kinds of other ones to pick off too, and that's us. Jesus rose from the dead. And so will all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, your, life, your life is not just meaningless, but once you understand that truth, once you understand that that future is there, that that salvation is there, now your life can have meaning. Now the things you do make a difference. Now the money you give does something eternal. Now the activities that you volunteer for have a difference into the future, not just for everybody else, but for you as well. You see, your life is not, if you are in Jesus Christ, your life is not just going round and round from one meaningless season to the next. Your life instead is going somewhere Your life is not a circle. Your life is an arrow. Your life is not cyclical. Your life is linear. 
It is going someplace. It's, an, it's a, a line with a point on the end. It's an arrow. And your life is going somewhere, and that somewhere is going to be greater and greater and greater than what it was before. And so this is our life in Jesus Christ. Secular life, it's just like the poem says, but in Christ you have something permanent in your life, and now you are doing things that matter, and, a, and they matter for all eternity. So when you volunteer to be on a committee for a blood drive, or when you say, I'll, I'll help with Bible school or Sunday school, when you say, I'll run for a position, when you say, I'll be part of this group, or whatever kind of thing that you do in this life, those activities are going to make a difference in your future. You see, what you're doing now is going to make a difference in your future. There's meaning to it. There's fullness in it. There's wonder and joy in it. Here's a beautiful truth. In Christ, there is a time to be born, and there's a time to be born again. There's a time to be born, and there's a time to be born anew into this living hope as we put our faith in Christ. So come to Jesus Christ. Come to him in faith. Put your full trust in him and let him envelop you into a whole new kind of life that doesn't go round and round but goes somewhere. What season are we in? Hebrews 4, 7 gives us another answer where it says, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, he calls it saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We're always in that season, always in the season to say, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ again today. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to let him hang on to me, and I am going to go somewhere. And everything I do in this crazy mixed up world is going to have meaning and joy and fulfillment. May the Lord bless you as you live out the seasons that God has given to you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for meaning in life, for joy in life, for truth. We thank you for the way you have transformed our meaninglessness into your fulfillment and we pray strengthen each one of us that we might respond to you today in faith and put our faith in you trust in you in every way and let you transform our lives in this wonderful way we ask this in jesus name amen Thank you so much, Pastor Bob, for bringing the Word of God to us. We are grateful for Christ who gives us hope for tomorrow. Because we all understand, I think instinctively, the meaningless of life without some sort of escape from the endless cycle of seasons. Thank you so much for coming. Go forth with the blessing of the Lord from Second Peter. Beloved, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.